Well, welcome, Mary. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be with you both. I've admired your podcast. It's a lot of fun, but actually very informative. Thank Thank you. you. Well, I'm excited because we have your book right here in front of us, and it's something that I think so many people could get a lot of great information. So I want to learn about that. And then also about your background and your coaching career, your, your coaching that you do as well. So I guess before we start briefly, tell us how you got into coaching. You know, I've all my life, I've really wanted to support the growth and development of other people. And I, I tried non-for-profit areas early in my career and wasn't for me. I've always loved the the pace of business. And since most of us spend our waking hours working, right, uh, it's it's a very important time to to really be able to feel like you can reach certain goals and uh, manifest your strengths. And so I got into coaching right after graduate school. I I went to the University of Virginia, got my PhD and moved to Tampa and worked with a a consulting firm. And the firm really focused on leadership development. And as I grew in my career, I became one of their executive coaches and I've been doing that work ever since. The nice thing is I coach more women now. Uh, Earlier in my career, as I became a more skilled coach, I would deal with a lot of C-suite people who tended to be predominantly male. So um, there's more women on the landscape now, and that's that's really great. In 2014, I started something called the Key Women's Leadership Forum. And the purpose of the forum is to bring together women in leadership roles to focus on what's uh, important to them, what's purposeful for them, their true north, so to speak. So it's a, it's a place where women in leadership like yourselves uh, can have a board of trusted advisors. And um, they also get individual coaching as well as it's, it's kind of a group coaching experience. So that uh, continues to grow and expand and, and, and is really the majority of the work um, that Key Associates does now. That's great. Have you always wanted to be a coach or what, whenever you were young, well, what did you? It, it, I, I actually was the president and CEO of a medical device company for a short time. And um, I, for being a coach to a player. Yeah. yeah. Some people like to be the player, you know, um, yeah. and uh, others, you know, that some people want to be, you know, from the past, the Michael Jordan and then there are others that just want to be the great coach. Right. You have to utilize your strengths and weaknesses or know what they are. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's so many people out there that um, have great life stories and they work in interesting situations. And we tend to get hired by companies and then provide coaching for people within those companies. So, uh, you know, for me, it's wonderful to peer into all these different worlds. I feel like I've lived multiple lifetimes because I, I get to see life through many pairs of eyes. That's awesome. I love that. So we, we want to pick your brain a little yeah. bit because you have so much good information to share. I feel like we could do you know, a whole hour long podcast on this and more, but in going through your book, one thing that really stood out to me and that I wanted to talk to you more about is your secret sauce to confidence because I feel like that's so many things that that's such a big topic that women lack a lot of times, especially in the Mm -hmm. business world. So I want to pick your brain on that and and see what you have to say. Oh, absolutely. Well, it's one of the reasons I believe that many women stumble or don't feel confident enough to take that next step, which is critical. And so the the name of the chapter from Seizing Success, A Woman's Guide to Transformational Leadership is uh, Confidence, the Secret Sauce. And so the goal here is for us to develop it. And there are a lot of different ways that women get waylaid in developing their confidence. And I think it starts when we're young. I don't know how you were brought up, but I find across a lot of different age ranges, um, many little girls you know, excel in this, their studies and they get reinforced and they get confused because, if, you know, they don't get an A. Uh, their parents are like, whoa, you, you didn't get, you, you got a B. And then if their little brother or older brother <laughs> just passes, their parents are thrilled. So from a young age, we're kind of taught 
that being perfect and getting recognition for getting things right is important. And so we develop this cautiousness, I think, in general. And there's a lot of studies that's been, that have been done on women and taking risks. And it's interesting because under stress, women are more risk adverse, whereas women, men are more likely to say, well, what the heck, I'm gonna take a chance. And so for many of the, of, of the young boys and, and, and future men, what happens for them is that they're playing in a game, they get hurt, they're encouraged to get back in there. Um, it's not a problem, they can change positions. And we don't always have that. And it's really wonderful to see more young women playing soccer and other sports, but I don't think sports is the only place that we need to learn that. I think parents really need to make it okay for their daughters to make mistakes. In fact, even celebrate them. You know, I was um, hearing uh, Sarah Blakely, who is the CEO of Spanx, very, very successful. And, you know, we, we love her because she's local, right? Yeah, and um, she was talking about how exceptional her upbringing was and how it prepared her for Spanx. She and her brother would do things and make mistakes and, and they'd sit down at the dinner table and their dad would always say, okay, what mistake did you make today? What did you learn from it? And we don't have those kind of conversations. So we need to look at how we bring uh, young women up to get that secret sauce. But then once we're in a work situation, I'm sure you see this in the kind of work you do. There's some uh, organizations that are a great fit and people excel, male or female, and there are others that are toxic. And it can be the toxic environment that really makes you second guess yourself. And, and so um, in the book, I give an example, a true story of, of a woman that just became so obsessed with getting her quarterly talks right because her CEO, who she reported to, would publicly embarrass her or challenge her in front of not only her people that reported to her, but board members. And um, that chips away at your confidence. Right. No, I'm glad that you mentioned sports. Um, I was kind of smiling and chuckling to myself because my little girl is in softball and that's, I definitely see her gain a lot of confidence with that. And we've talked a lot about confidence, like directly and indirectly on the podcast previously, but it's really nice to have someone that, you know, works in it daily with coaching other people, PhD, you know, author of a book. So I'm really excited to hear, hear all of this from you. Well, you know, it, it, one of the stories that I put in the book, it's, it's absolutely true. I, I was asked to speak at um, the Women in Capital Markets um, uh, International Conference for Raymond James. And one of um, the keynote speakers there uh, was the author of The Confidence Code and uh, uh, Caddy Kay. And uh, actually it was Claire Shipman that was there, the Caddy Kay and Claire Shipman wrote the book. And, um, and, and Claire, uh, they were both journalists. So they, they had the connections to get in front of the right audience. And uh, they interviewed uh, Christina Lagarde, who at the time headed the International Monetary Fund, and Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany. And they asked about perfection. And they, they asked about, you know, um, do they feel that? How do they address it? And in separate interviews, they both said they overprepare, they, they scrutinize what they do, they, and they spend an extraordinary amount of time doing that because they don't want to get caught. How many men leaders do that to that degree? I don't feel like any of them. I'm just yeah. saying. So, so even our models, right, you know, now, now I, I think that's changing. However, part of the issue here is that what we expect from leaders lines up with the characteristics we see in effective men, but they don't always line up with the characteristics of what we expect from women. Mm -hmm. So if I said to you, what are the things that you see in an effective leader, forget the sex, you know, the sex of the person, what, what, what would you see? Well, confidence for sure. Confidence. Yeah. yeah. Assertiveness. Assertiveness, Influence. decisiveness, risk-taking, because leaders, by their definition, they go first, right? 
Yeah. If I'm a leader, I have to go first. If I don't go first, I'm not a leader, right? right? All those things and the, you know, what makes a successful um, male leader line up. But for women, we're, we're supposed to be collaborative. We're supposed to be socially sens- sensitive and, and we're supposed to make sure that there's harmony. So we're, we're often in the mediation role. So you have a woman like that being assertive. It surprises people. And, and they go, where is she coming from? Do I trust her? You know, because, you know, she's supposed to be this. And, and a lot of it is unconscious bias. It's not even like in the conscious process. They, they just see it. And I think an example, and you tell me if, you're, if um, I'm wrong on this, but I'm willing to bet $1,000 that oh, each I'm of in. you... Each of you had the experience. Okay, a <laughs> hundred. Each of you, well, each of you have had this experience. You go into, you have somewhere in your career gone into a room, predominantly male people at the table. You share an idea or suggestion. Nobody seems to hear it. Fifteen minutes later, a guy at the table says the same thing. It's a great and, idea. It's a great idea. That's yes. an example of this. Okay, I keep my money then. Yeah, you <laughs> do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that happens true. more often than not, which is sad. It is sad, oh. but that's an example of that that particular bias. So with with perfection, you know, the thing I encourage women to do is start making mistakes. You know, take risks. Mm-hmm. Now, you want to weigh them out, yeah, right? So so you know, what's the worst thing that can happen? What's the best thing that can happen? Mm-hmm. And can you live with the results? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if, if you can answer those questions, well, I can live with the results of the worst thing that could happen. Try it. Humor is a great thing. Right. Um, and it's not like men aren't friends. I mean, you could share some of this stuff with them. They all be laughing about it together, but we keep it inside. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, Hey, I, you know, I've never gone, I've never gotten in front of a group and um, did a talk on a topic I didn't know anything about, but I'm going to try it. And you do. And people laugh at you. So Mm -hmm. what? That's great advice. Is that what you mean by act as if and let go? Like, well, actually uh, that's, that's that's the take the risk, but act as if and let go is, is even, it's, it's like another layer on top of it. It's a really good thing. Um, neuroscience right now shows that our energy level, our our gestures, whether we smile or not, can really transform how we feel and how we come across in terms of confidence. Right. And uh, some research done out of Harvard by Dr. Amy Cuddy, and her book was pretty popular for a while called Presence. And she, what she did is she had people um, do poses and change their physiology before going into an interview. So right, you're you're in the um, the search business, right? So this is you know perfect coaching for the candidates. You want to make sure do a good job. So so for example, you might do something called Wonder Woman, which is hard to see. Um, so I'll stand up and do it. Wonder Woman's like this, mm-hmm. and you hold that pose. She says for about two minutes, which seems like an eternity. Right. Um, so you know you can go in a bathroom stall and do that, or it can be. Um, that's the universal sign for victory like a and, or something like yeah, that yeah yes yeah the starfish or victory symbol yeah and it, so those are some examples of getting yourself prepared then you go in and act as if because the truth oh. is that confidence um carries you much further than competence mm-hmm. if i'm competent but i'm not acting confident no one's gonna know or even trust that I have the right thing. But if I get myself ready and I go in there and act as if with preparation, Mm -hmm. uh, it can make a big difference. Right. Is that kind of like fake it till you make it? Yes, that it it actually works. Now it doesn't always work. And I don't think it works when you're being deceptive. You know, like, like you're trying to rob people or put together, you know, a bad Bernie Madoff kind of deal. I don't, I, that, you know, that's, that's for that borders on something else of being a psychopath, but, um, <laughs> but what, you know, doing this is very important. And I think, right. I think rehearsal is good. Mm-hmm. 
you know, that's another way, like people say, okay, I got it all in my head. And as many talks as I've given, you know, when I'm in front of an audience, I always practice ahead. I record it on my phone. I listen back and I hear what I say well, and I say, okay, here I could do something different. You know, so rehearsal is also a, a good way to prepare yourself to fake it till you make it. Right. No. Not obsession, rehearsal. Right. No, that's, that's the key. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> how do you how do you cultivate a growth mindset? Well, that's a that's a wonderful term. And um, it's it was really coined by a, um, a, a woman out of Stanford, Dr. Uh, Carol Dwork and uh, Dweck, D-W-E-C-K. It's hard to pronounce her name. And she um, found that um, some of us have cl- uh, closed mindsets where we we feel like, OK, you know, I'm not good at that. I've always been good with numbers. I'm going to be successful doing this. This is what I do. And they don't venture out. And someone with a growth mindset is someone who honestly believes, yeah, you know, I have these tendencies, yes, and I use them, but I'm going to try doing this. I'm going to see, you know, if I could be good at marketing or if I could be good at, you know, coding. So, you know, it's it's staying open. But again, that element of being willing to make mistakes, you can't learn something new without making mistakes. And then there's some other work that was done um, by a, a wonderful um, researcher and thinker, uh, doc, Dr. Amy uh, Edmondson. And she found that when you position something like in a work environment as um, the, you need to learn this to perform, people were much more reluctant and um, nervous and they developed uh, resistance and it was hard for them to feel confident. But if you position something as an opportunity to learn, so, okay, here's something that you could try that um, if you learn it, it'll, it'll bring some value added as opposed to you must learn this so that um, you're performing adequately on this job. So that's like the distinction. Yeah. So how you frame things is really important right. as a leader, but it's also important for you personally to do for yourself. Right. And that's a, that's a great point because you want to think about that you know, if this is what's required, but just the way you position it can, you know, make a whole world of difference in the results that you get. And, and that's a great thing for the leaders and the, the C-level, the entrepreneurs that listen, when we always talk about setting your employees up for success, yeah. I think that's a huge value add right there is just knowing how you're communicating certain um, training pieces or, or skill sets. Absolutely. And the other one is, you know, I, I work with so many entrepreneurs and one of the things that some of them say is, you know, I don't mind if people make mistakes. I just don't want them to make the same expensive mistake twice. You know, and there's stories like, you know, somebody makes a million dollar mistake. They think they're, they're going to get fired. And the CEO says, fire you. I have just invested a million dollars in you, but you better right, not exactly. make that mistake again. Right. <laughs> um, so, so, I think it's important to communicate that, you know, it's okay, but also to kind of process that through, whether you're the CEO or you're a manager of an area with your folks, um, because sometimes people don't learn from that experience and then they make it again. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, on the, on the leadership level. So cultivating a growth mindset is really important. And I think it's one of the reasons that some people don't share. You know, I, I just want to say this on the record. I, I, they say, you know, Mary, all the stuff you talk about with leaders and you have these growth oriented women and your women's forums and, and you know, people that you work with, uh, you know, there are a lot of women that aren't nice to women in the workplace. Do you ever hear that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, I think about it. I'm like, you know, uh, whether it's male or female, someone that has a closed mindset wants to protect. So it's kind of like, You know, I had to work hard to get to where I am right now. And I'll be damned if I'm going to share this information with somebody else. And that's not a function of male or female. That's a function of having a closed mindset or having a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like the, the, the way, one of the ways we were able to succeed is 
our communication with each other as partners and sharing information and even, yeah, even with other business owners, right? It's just mm-hmm. kind of communicating and sharing ideas and sharing, sharing different things I feel like has been, I don't know, you know what I'm talking about though. Like, I feel like, um, just communicating to others and sharing, um, like what we see in the marketplace and just different things instead of holding it inside and mm-hmm. just telling them what we think they need to know, just sharing the, the value add and, um, I, the data I feel like has been exponential to, to our growth and just to communicating and to getting to where we need to be too. You know, having um, a peer forum of sorts, whether it's formal, like the Key Women's Leadership Forum or some of the CEO roundtables I work with, Mm -hmm. or more informal, but a group that you trust, that you respect, that you don't have to be perfect with. See, this is the real issue for women because they feel the pressure, like if they're going to initiate something or, you know, they get that one chance because they may get blocked out of that meeting where someone doesn't hear what they say. And so they put a lot of pressure on themselves and, and to have a place where you say, you know, I've got this idea and it's, you know, and you just get, throw it out there and you, you trust people to like noodle it with you and brainstorm it with you. And then you kind of have a chance to clean it up so that when you're ready to bring it forth, it's, it's something else. The other thing about um, perfection it, it, that I think is important is what we say to ourselves, you know, be very careful of your self-talk. Because I find that most people are a lot meaner to themselves than they are to anybody else. And, you know, like in parenting, you're taught, you know, don't tell Johnny he's stupid. Just say, Johnny, when you throw food at your sister and um, miss and hit her in the, you know, and it lands all over the floor and she starts crying, you know, that you describe the behaviors. You don't get into the label. And I think that's an important thing that not to label ourselves on uh, Saturday Night Live had a, uh, <laughs> for a while there. I don't know if you remember the segment, but um, uh, one of the, the great comedians on there, um, Bill, oh, not Bill Murray, but after Bill Murray, the, uh, the guy that was on Zooland, Zoolandia. Yeah, Z- yeah, I know who you're talking about. I can't yeah. Bill, Bill Hader, Bill okay. Hader, yeah. He, he used to um, do this thing where he would go, like he would, he would say something stupid. Then he'd go in the bathroom and he would like beat himself <laughs> up and he would say awful things to himself. And we, that's what we do psychologically. Yeah. Basically, yeah. <laughs> Not a rose cup. Yeah. Right. 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 I would never talk to anyone else. Like, right. I talk to myself, you know, I'm much, I am much meaner to myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the last thing around confidence is, is, is I do think it's important to remind you, yourself is that um this isn't all about you like with your podcast like i'm sure your first podcast you felt a little nervous right for sure yeah Yeah. and when you when you remind yourself that you're doing it for the education of others a bigger purpose right that gets you out of your head but it's it it makes you more confident like you know i'm not just doing this because i want people to say i'm a good whatever this is really important and here's what it's going to do. So having a higher purpose and reminding yourself in your self-talk uh, is a, is a very good way to bolster confidence. I like that one. That's my favorite part. Of oh. confidence. Thank you. I love that. That, that resonates well with me. Um, okay. So one of the other things that you had in your book, Mary, um, is the resilience piece that I was like, wow, I really like to pick your brain on that. Sure. What, what, you know, what does it mean to be resilient, but, but also how do you, you know, why should you be resilient and how, how do you be resilient? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think right now the the book was written before COVID and um, being resilient is, has never been more important because, you know, the downside of um, not being resilient is truly shriveling up and dying. And, you know, and you can do that in a variety of different ways, you know, through depression, through, you know, excessive habits, through actually dying, you know, um, willing yourself, you know, to do that. And some people have done that, you know, uh, many years ago in a book called called Man's Search for Meaning, um, Dr. Frederick Frankel uh, talked about how his experience in the concentration camps that, that some people had no higher 
purpose and they had nothing to be resilient for and they could just throw a blanket over their heads and die the next day wow yeah. whereas other people lived and so he he his bigger purpose and what made him stay resilient was that if he got out of the concentration camp he would teach the world these lessons and so his book man's search for meaning um you know came from that and so i think one big thing about staying resilient is that we need to feel like we have a purpose yes all this terrible stuff's going on all over the world in haiti afghanistan all the different things happening right now um you know we're losing the environment climate change how how do we cope well what brings meaning to us and how can we continue to remind ourselves of that um and then part of resilience is just feeling pressure to perform. And we did a study uh, a couple of years ago in Tampa Bay of women executives and work-life integration was the top issue, but the second highest issue was women feeling pressure to perform in all aspects of their life, like feeling pressure to perform in their jobs, feeling pressure to be successful as a mother, if they had kids, you know, in their in community. And so, um, we're nodding our heads over here like, yep, uh-huh, I feel that, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and you want to be good at all of them, right? Yes. And um, I, I think, you know, in, in the book, I talk about uh, some research done that um, talks about the, the principle of just enough, that if you're going to have one big goal that's going to push your resilience, it's something you need to believe in and want to do. And being achievement-oriented, don't at, don't do that in every aspect of your life. So an example would be, let's say you want to run your own company and you're running your own company um, and that takes a lot of pressure. So are you going to say, okay, and on a physical level, I want to run a, I want to run a half marathon. I have to prep for that. And then I want to, I want to be a good parent. So I'm going to be on the board of the PTA or whatever the group is, you know, so you're like maxing yourself out, not doing anything well, not having enough time for yourself, depleting your, your resistance and your ability to stay resilient. So did I answer your question on that? Yes. Yeah. And, and so an ex a fun example, I think you um, talked about the, uh, this, this game. Um, Cause one thing that, that, keeps us again from being resilient, just as it impacts, you know, other areas like confidence is um, what we fear, right? So if we're afraid, um, it's hard to stay resilient. And so um, uh, the true story, this, this uh, IT professional out of Canada, I um, believe his name is um, Jason Comley. And he accidentally came upon a psychological uh, therapy that really works, he didn't realize it, uh, called exposure therapy. So what he was afraid of being rejected. So he just decided that he wanted to build his resilience. And so he would find ways of getting, uh, asking something each day that more than likely he was gonna be rejected. And to his surprise sometimes, it didn't happen like he would ask, you know, someone, do you want me to clean your house? Or, you know, do you want to meet me for coffee? Or, you know, whatever it was. And he, he became so successful at building his resilience uh, to being rejected that he uh, created a card game that people play and um, just, you know, kind of do it that way. And, and this, this um, concept started with systematic desensitization where many times people had a phobia like a fear of snakes or, you know, whatever. And so that you would slowly get exposure to that. So that's how the psychologist did it. Well, Stephanie's like, nope, not, not happening. Not well, if you happen. want, if you want to, like, <laughs> but, but th there are some people, not me, but there are some people who feel like they could get you comfortable holding a, a boa constrictor. That's not, you know, for me, especially if you fear snakes, but, but that's kind of what he was doing. Mm -hmm. You know, it kind of got, got to be, oh, well, I'm going to ask this hot woman out and maybe I'll get rejected, but who cares? Yay. And, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's a way to build some resilience. Um, if you, if you feel your resilience is compromised by fear, what are you afraid of and how do you address it? Right. 
No, I've tried to do that with myself in public speaking, just speaking in front of others, because that is something I am very afraid of and I, I hate it, but I want to get better at it. I don't want to be afraid of it anymore. So I'll put myself in these very uncomfortable situations Good. and then now I, I don't have a choice. I already agreed to it. Right. So now I have to. Right. And, right. And, and, you know, you, you know, the other thing is, and, and I think a lot of people for look at it differently, but I encourage you to look at your stress as a gift. Okay. So your palms are getting sweaty. You're feeling a little breathy. You got this talk you're going to give. Well, your body's trying to get you prepared and actually that heightened attention, if you use it correctly, because, you know, I, I know very few great speakers that don't have a few butterflies before they get in front of an audience. Now the audience changes, you know, like, you know, one, what was 50 people becomes 2000. Well, at 2000, they might go oh, crap, you know? So like just make stress your friend, thank your body. Hey, my body's trying to help me get ready, you know, as opposed to, Oh no. Oh, oh no. I shouldn't be feeling this. Right. Cause then you're in conflict. Right. Right. Exactly. I like that. Thank yeah. your body. That's amazing. I, um, I think I've realized that, okay, I need to teach my kids that too, right? Not yes. to be fearful. Um, and I feel like after the COVID year, that's really kind of come into my viewpoint as sure. like, maybe this is something I need to start teaching my kids, not, not to be fearful. Cause it's really easy to go down that rabbit hole of, Oh no, you know, it's, everyone's getting sick again, the Delta variant, like it's happening all over again. And it's, you know, probably just best to kind of face that fear and try to not combat it. Right. Because we don't want to get into that negative mindset or, or, you know, feeling, but, but just to realize it and to say, Hey, it's okay. It's just, our bodies are preparing us for, to face it. I think you're steps ahead of a lot of people. Well, really, because uh, a lot of people don't want to talk about it because they think, okay, if we talk about it, it's going to be painful. But just to have a conversation with, hey, there's so much going on with COVID right now. How are you guys feeling? You know, what, you know, what, what are your thoughts? And just making it okay to, to talk about it the same way you want to make making a mistake. Mm -hmm. Okay. To talk about yeah, and process. Oh, I like mm -hmm. that. One more thing I want to talk about that um I felt was a great topic in your book is influence yes so let's let's talk about that really quick because let's face it everyone has wanted to have influence over someone before mm -hmm. over something um tell us about how you turn on this influence power well it's uh interesting I think it's learning about the nature of influence one of the most interesting things for me is that we all have different styles of influence. And I've been interested in influence, um, male, female, you know, not really any gender um, bias around it, but just as a leader, when in your leadership role, it's important to learn how to influence. And so um, I, I got an opportunity uh, to work with um, Dr. Terry Bacon, who's done probably the most extensive research on influence globally. And um, he identified 10 different influencing styles. And so what I talk to people about many times when I do programs on leadership and influence is, uh, you know, describe to me how you would like to be influenced. And you'll see very quickly that some people like data and a facts-based argument. Other people like more of a consultative approach. Like, hey, this is the thing I'm looking at. How do you see this? You know, what, what could our joint be, goal be to solve this? That resonates with some people. There are other people that like to be, you know, have their values appealed to. So in these different styles, uh, there, there's some that tend to be more logical persuasion. There's some that tend to be more emotional, like appealing to values, like, um, you know, um, 
I hate even saying it this way with all the controversy in politics, but it's kind of like saying, this is what America is all about. You know, that would, you know, that appeals to values. There's no data there, you're just saying. And then, um, then there are some others that tend to be more like there's one style called legitimizing where you sort of bring authorities in like, you know, I'd really like to do this, but um, our FDA, FDA guidelines say that we can't, you know, so it's like bringing in a, a authority or, or the CEO says we can't, you know, so some people have that kind of style. So once you identify your style, what's interesting in this research that Dr. Bacon and others have done is that we tend to use our own style on someone else. And that's probably the biggest mistake if they're different. So, you know, have you ever been with someone and men tend to use logical persuasion more than women sometimes where you, you know, you just have a belief in something intuitively that's kind of like an appeal to your values. Like I, I just feel it. And they're trying to give you the facts, right? And, and th they're not going to influence you. So what you need to do is identify what your style is and know it. And sometimes we have a couple different ones. And then also the style of the person you're trying to influence. And then if I know the person I'm trying to influence uh, reacts positively to logical persuasion, it's my job to build that case, mm -hmm. right? So if I'm, I'm you know, um, if, if you're representing me and you do a placement of me in, in a key position and I wanna negotiate my salary, uh, I, I've, you know, deduced the person that, is offering me this job is more logical persuasion. I'm going to have prepared, here's what people who hold this position across the United States make. And here's, you know, so I'm gathering that in a, in a different way. Um, so influencing is, is situational. It, um, it, you know, it's bi bi-directional meaning that um, when I try to influence you, you also come back and try to influence me. So it's a dance. And an example of that might be my, my friend, Carol. She's, um, she like did all this research on the car she wanted and how much it cost and all of that. And she, she went to a dealership and she said, this is what I'm prepared to pay you. And she was so proud of herself because they accepted her offer and it wasn't very generous. And then the guy upsold her on about $12,000 worth of add-ons in terms of, you know, the car and what went in it. So, so, you know, <laughs> it's bi-directional, right? You know, she, she got hers, but then he <laughs> came back and she wound up spending 12,000 more than she wanted to. That's a great real world example. example. I love yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. And it happens at work too. Right. And, um, and then if you, if you don't tune into the other person's style, it's like being on the wrong frequency. Mm -hmm. If you can remember back to when radios were tuned a little bit, right? Or even now, like if you're using the scanner in a car, a rental car, and you kind of get to a station, it doesn't sound, it's not lined up. So that's how it sounds to a person if you're trying to use a style of influencing them that doesn't fit them. It, mm -hmm. it, it just not resonating. So that's the other thing you need to, to look for as you uh, go about influencing. And, and I, uh, I mean, I'm making available uh, to you um, a free assessment people can take. So it's, I guess it's gonna be in the notes of this program. Yes, and I encourage you to try it, yeah. I think that would be good for employees, employers to give to their employees whenever they're hiring them. That way they know what their influence style is and mm -hmm. how, how they could communicate better. Yes. And it's also important for the employee to know, because if you want to be able, like you think about it as the employee influencing all, is all you really have, because you don't have that hierarchical power, you know, your boss does. So if you know your boss is influencing style and some people go, how does she get everything she wants? Well, I bet that person studied with that other person's influencing style and knew how to position stuff. Right. I love that. Thank you so much for providing that for everyone. I'm going to go take it. I think I know what my influencing first kind of initial thing would be, but I'm going to take the test just to make sure. Me too. Well, that's great. And then I'm also going to provide another link. So if you've enjoyed some of the um, 
concepts from the book, I, I put together an assessment, which is free. You can go to our site and uh, take the assessment and has more information also on, on the book. So. Thank nice. you, Mary. We'll include those in the show notes and um, also Mary's book, A Seizing Success. So where it's on Amazon. Book? Okay. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. You can. And an audio book too. So you can, you can get the audio book through audible. Nice. Well, that is just a little nugget of information that you can find in her book that we talked about today, but there's mm-hmm. so much more. And I, I mean, I thought today was very valuable. Yeah. I, I thank you so much, Mary, for sharing your knowledge with oh, us. You're so welcome. The time really flew. It so did. thank you for the, for the opportunity. Yes. No, thank you. And until next time, live bold and boss up. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. That's assertiveness.